This episode of Analysis in Chains is brought to you by our sponsor, Bankera. Bankera is building a digital bank for the blockchain era, and their token sale is on until the end of February. You can find out more when you visit them at www.bankera.com. And now for our show. This is the Analysis in Chains with Nathan Williams and Neil Kieran. Welcome to Analysis in Chains. I'm Nathan Williams, and joining me today are Giorgio Zinetti and Yves Petitjean, the CTO and CFO of Valid. Valid is a token that allows you to have a self-sovereign data wallet or a data identity that uh, allows you to basically interact with uh, people that want your data, people that you need to identify yourself with. It's an interesting project. We're going to talk to them about it today. Guys, thank you for joining us. <laughs> thank good you morning. for having us. Thank you for having us. Oh, you're very welcome. Was that a good description uh, of your project, you know, a data identity in a self-sovereign wallet? Yeah, in a sense, valid is not an integrated personal platform. We call it integrated because it includes a digital identity, like an e-passport, if you will, which uh, enables you to authenticate yourself online. But it's a lot more than that. Valid also provides you with the tools and the marketplace to monetize your anonymized personal data with the so-called data consumers. And essentially, uh, product and service companies, but also market and academic researchers and so on. And what we mean by personal data is that any data that is indicative of your individual's way of life, so our taste, our preferences, our habits, etc. And that's what we call psychometric data. And currently, these um, data consumers, advertisers, and so forth, have to pay a number of intermediaries to reach consumers, you and I. And that's done in the most of inefficient ways. But with valid users, we'll be able to get remunerated directly in valid token, but also receive timely and relevant marketing in exchange for providing access to their data in an anonymized fashion. And data consumers in exchange um, will receive high reliability data, which is actually related to real individuals, not bots or personas like you have uh, currently perhaps, perhaps uh, on, on Facebook, and also in an anonymized way. So that's, in a sense, what, what the Valid Project is all about. I see. And so th th this topic uh, seems to be a hot topic right now. I've talked to another people who've been approaching a similar problem in very different ways. Um, and I'm just sort of wondering, what specifically about your project are you attempting to tackle? Like, with the, is this idea of self-sovereignty um, re really key to, ident uh, to identity? Well, self-sovereignty relates to the digital identity uh, layer, and, and that's part of the whole valid platform, if you will. And self-sovereignty uh, basically relates to the idea that users are able to control and have uh, full control over the identity and the way it's being handled, safeguarded, and used. And right now, the equivalent of a government verified, if you will, digital identity, the only people that are able to provide you with one are actually government digital identities. And uh, it's important to note that 2.2 uh, billion people on the planet, this is according to the World Bank, um, have no documents and therefore no proof of providing uh, uh, the that they in fact exist, they have no birth certificates, they have no official documents. And so the blockchain community has started to think around solution that uh, through a different way, through a decentralized verification process uh, that could provide these individuals with some form of identity that will find a chain of trust, web of trust, um, would be able to actually provide uh, attributes that have been verified enough to reach a level of assurance which is almost as good as if it had been provided by a centralized authority or a government in that case. So this is an interesting aspect of it, is the this nature of who can tell you that you're a real person. Um, you know, are you still like, are you still relying on governments uh, in order to have that uh, that credibility for valid? 
Yeah, so how we are building Valid, you do not necessarily need governments to be on, on board. So, of course, governments can be part of the verification process of Valid. Uh, but if people decide to trust other sources like uh, other individuals, machines, institutions, NGOs, uh, that's the beauty of Valid. Every, everyone can verify everything. And, uh, you know, some governments might be more corrupt and less trustworthy than uh, companies. So that's a little bit the concept. It's up to the people to decide whom they trust. That's fascinating because uh, so there's a number of different companies that are uh, looking at this idea of data self-sovereignty and data monetization. But it seems, if I understand correctly, that you're really looking at identity as uh, as sort of the uh, the core problem that you're solving like who you are and who other people say you are in the in the wider society is is that That's accurate, accurate but it's also accurate to say that we're not the only one in the sector there's quite a number of initiatives of blockchain and non-blockchain solutions that are trying to tackle this problem but ultimately our vision is that we think that uh, within the next five to ten years, digital identity, self-sovereign digital identities, will be a, a, a public utility, and that uh, within this time frame, only a handful of companies or initiatives will will be established and recognized on a global scale. And uh, with that in mind, the solution that we're proposing is, in effect, an agnostic platform that will be able to accommodate. Uh, some of these winning solutions for uh, self-sovereign blockchain-enabled digital identity. Now, th this is a very interesting concept, the concept of I am who other people say I am. You know, I think most people have sort of innate, an innate uh, idea of um, their identity being their role in society or, or, you know, their job or who the government says they are. Uh, but this idea of actually giving a legal definition to it from the crowd uh, is, I think, rather new. Uh, do you think that people will uh, will accept that readily, or do you think it's going to take some time? I think it's going to take some time. Uh, initially, the use cases that are going to uh, be, be, be done are uh, KYC, uh, onboarding, and verification or of attributes that are very, very concrete. But I think in the future... Um, this can really replace uh, how, the, how the passport is, is recognized uh, around the, 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 the world. So you will be able to open bank accounts, uh, open uh, you know a contract with your telecommunication provider, and yeah. What's also interesting is that we see different groups and different ecosystems as as to who the accrediting and verifying parties could be. Uh, we have initiatives where the verifying groups or, or, or nodes, if you will, are financial institutions, uh, insurance and banks. Uh, we also have other initiatives where the verifying accrediting parties are the opposite. They're specifically non-private companies. Uh, they are supranational companies instead, or association institutions, universities, so on and so forth. And, and we see the emergence of different protocols, each for the different ways of looking at who gets to accredit and validate an individual's data. And at the beginning, is it, uh, you, I imagine that you're keeping it to accredited institutions, right? Uh, no, so it's it's gonna be open for everyone, and then uh, we're gonna have a, a record where people can do lookups and see. Okay, those uh, verifications uh, are made by this authority or this, you know, Bob or Alice, and then it's up to the community to say, okay, I trust that the, the government is is trustworthy, or I trust Alice or Bob and Bob. Yeah. Now, th I mean, it's a fascinating concept. My I can imagine that uh, that as you get started, it's going to run fairly smoothly. But what happens when you get big? Um, if you end up uh, becoming a the global solution, would there be political uh, uh, like political va vectors of attack against certain people possible? And 
is, is that something that we should prepare against or something that's just an inevitable part of the system? I'm not too worried about that because the, on the blockchain, the reputation has a huge impact. And if authorities are going to verify malicious attributes about people, the community will quickly react and, and discredit the authority and all the claims ever made by this uh, uh, identity will not be considered valid anymore. So uh, this is, I think, is not a big problem. Uh, the, 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 the other way around, valid helps solve those kind of problems uh, where you now have a track record of all validations. And if there's something malicious or fraudulent happening, you have a track record and you can pinpoint who, who committed the fraud and, and yeah, the bad actors. Yeah. I mean, I know that this is sort of a theoretical uh, point in the future, but I just imagine that you must have uh, thought about it at some point, which is uh, what happens if you have the larger crowd doesn't have as much information uh, about certain people? Uh, like, would there be propaganda potential if, say, uh, there was a propaganda against uh, a high profile individual or I, I don't know. I, maybe this is uh, a problem for tomorrow valid and not today valid. <laughs> as I, you know, as, as I stated earlier, the, uh, we're providing an agnostic platform uh, and there'll be, uh, as I said, there's, there's quite a number of protocols out there, digital identity protocols that are being sketched out and will soon be production ready. What we think is that there'll be, a handful of them that would be successful and our platform will be able to accommodate the most successful amongst them and the ones that have uh, that have been uh, not only have proven themselves on uh, the larger scales but that also uh, proven themselves with the users um, and that uh, proven to be uh, trustworthy but also uh, get a certain degree of security and value will be able to accommodate uh, the most established amongst them no, I, oh, I, I imagine so. Uh, I think the nature of my question is more about blockchain in general. There's uh, so many ways that blockchain is going to uh, disrupt the way that we traditionally do things. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on sort of some of the consequences or changes that, uh, or problems of tomorrow that might come up that we may not expect. Uh, if everyone's I, uh, ID is confirmed by the crowd? Well, we, Valid tackles more than just identity because we take the view that there's a merging between personal data of, of, of an individual, but also what is considered now the core of digital identity, i.e. what's in your passport currently, and, and what gives you the ability to transact with not only your government, but also with banks and insurance companies, etc. But if you think about it, the marketplace doesn't really care um, about your address or your name. All it cares about uh, is whether you have a credit card and what it is that you like to buy. And this psychometric data, your taste, your preferences, etc., is is the kind of data that is currently being exploited by uh, sometimes honestly, sometimes less honestly, that is being exploited by all the intermediaries that we know, the, the Google and the Facebook of the world, and in exchange for uh, you providing all kinds of data about yourself that they can then sell onwards, uh, they provide some kind of value. But we've also seen that there's been abuse, uh, abuse of the personal data sphere of the individual, but also uh, not a week goes by without a uh, major hack happening in a major corporation. And these are, you know, if you take the point of view that personal data is, is, is a new asset class, or as The Economist stated, the new oil, then it's only fair that we give back some control over their data to the individual. And that's what Valid is trying to accomplish. It's an ambitious project, but uh, we you know ambitious people that are trying to tackle a product which is also which is also becoming more and more mainstream. When we first thought about it, it was very much uh, uh, addressed in the scientific communities and in publications like Harvard Business Review. But in the recent months, the Economist has made a cover about it. The Quine Haas uh, made a made a cover about data protection and how it's being collected and, and, and used on, on individuals' behalf. Spiegel and Germany is doing the same thing. So it's become that that concept is, is gaining, gaining a lot more traction than it used to. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you must have seen that uh, that Facebook recently had a judgment against them from Germany about uh, uh, their uh, role in data protection. Correct. And 
Yeah, I can imagine that uh, that having a ripple effect to other large uh, entities. And I guess uh, I guess what you guys are aiming to do is sort of get that self sovereignty there, so that you have informed consent, you have sort of anonymized uh, anonymized marketplaces. Uh, uh, like, how do you see the uh, data protection playing out in the in the rest of Europe with uh, with the big companies? Well, it, it so happens that yeah, we the European has come up with very drastic data protection laws, and they call the Data Protection Regulation GDPR. They're coming into force in 2018, and it will it will radically change the way these companies are currently conducting business. And, and, and for instance, I'll just give you an example. Um, You'll be able to, uh, as of May, you'll be able to, as a European citizen, you'll be able to write to Facebook, wherever they, the headquarters are in Europe, I think it's Ireland, and you'll be able to ask them, um, please, you've got a week to send me in a readable electronic format all the data that you have on me and have been processing since I've been a member, and you've got a week to comply. And if that information has value for Facebook, um, then... Uh, obviously, it could have value for someone else, for another company, for uh, uh, a product and service company, for example, that operates within Europe. And so by asking Facebook to return or at least to share everything they've got on the individual, the individual can then in turn sell that information to anyone who's willing to pay for it. So it's, in a sense, leveling the playing field for all the digital companies out there and, and, and also allowing smaller companies to have access to an enormous amount of data that has been uh, the monopoly of some of these big Silicon Valley giants. I think uh, I think you're totally right that it's going to really change uh, the playing field. Um, I don't know. In my in my point of view, it's likely going to have a ripple effect, uh, and other governments are going to follow suit. I mean, people are really sensitive about their data right now. Uh, is that if people are sensitive about their data? How do you get beyond the uh, sort of the nervousness or squeamishness that they would have about selling it at all? Yeah, so the idea is that <clears throat> the selling the idea, the data is only an option. Uh, we want to enable the, the users to protect the data first. And then in the second stage, if they want to, they can start to monetize on it. But this is only uh, an option that comes in later. <clears throat> for those that are very, very sensitive and do not want to share their data for any reason, we provide this option as well. So it's going to be this safeguard um, concept that we are developing so the people can request back the data from the Facebook and the Googles and just uh, store it on their local device, have multiple backups and never share it again with anyone. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I think that, that sounds similar to what I've uh, talked with with other people that are entering into the data space. Um, have you found your early adopters have been more interested in the monetization, though, or have, has it been more people who have been uh, re uh, worried about privacy? We have both. I think uh, what 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 interests users the most, I think, is is the concept and the perspective of regaining control over their data. I don't think that all of them are quite ready to start monetizing um, uh, on, on a scale that, that, that perhaps isn't them today. Uh, but keep in mind, they can also choose to anonymize all the data they could potentially monetize. But I think what interests the, the users and the people we talk to, the community that we have built, is this, is this fairness that, that the platform uh, provides, this fairness of owning one's data and, and giving the choice as to what to do with that data. Um, when you're talking about anonymized data, like, I mean, how do you actually anonymize and like, uh, and, and keep it safe? Like, as soon as there's a, a marketplace, wouldn't people have to uh, submit some data or at least be identified that they're in the market to sell data? Yeah, there, there are multiple ways to anonymize the data. I can give you an example. You can just um, allow um, data consumer to get access to, for example, your height, and then uh, um, we, you, you, your height get mixed up with the height of a, a million other individuals, and the data consumer can run computation on this information and get only the output of the computation. So. Um, or there are some other <clears throat> encryption schemes, uh, schemes uh, the 
the, the buzzword now is uh, homomorphic encryption that enables computation to be run on encrypted pieces of data. So the data consumer will only see the output of a computation and not the individual pieces of the data sets. So we have uh, a different techniques that we want to use there. And um, <clears throat> the perfect uh, anonymity is not possible because there is always uh, some risks, especially giving out large amount of data, uh, but we definitely have options there. <clears throat> when you're talking about, uh, like, I know this is a little more technical than we usually go to in interviews, but I'm curious, what exactly is homomorphic encryption? <laughs> So you, you know what an encrypted piece of data is? It's a piece of data that you don't understand what it is. Yep. Uh, homomorphic encryption allows you to run computation on, on a data set and get a result that actually makes sense. Uh, so uh, maybe, okay, let's say you have, uh, it's used for example in voting systems. You encrypt the votes of all the participants in a vote, and then you run the computation and see who won the voting, but you do, do not compromise the privacy of the voters. You could, you could do the same for any data sets, like calculating the some average um, marker for blood samples, some health data, something very sensitive, and you would have only the statistical means, you would have uh, the some computation out of it and without breaking the, uh, the privacy of each individual. That's, in, that's really interesting. It's, uh, so, so essentially you would have, you would run these computations on the encrypted data and then you would know for sure that the output is valid. Exactly. Valid, exactly. Even, even though you don't necessarily know what the inputs are. Oh, exactly. Right. Yes. Um, speaking of data, Blockchains are notorious for having low throughput and not uh, being expensive to store large amounts of data on. How are you managing the vast amount of data that you'll be, you know, collecting and assembling with uh, uh, with Valid? Yeah, so the, we do not store the data on the blockchain, of course. We just uh, store the hash of the data. Uh, the hash of the data is just uh, a very small piece of data, a string, uh, that enables... Uh, in uh, afterwards to to link back the data to the string so you can have a mechanism to verify the integrity of the data so we just save this little information about the data so that if someone gets uh, his hang on this hash he cannot understand what the data is but there's a mechanism to verify the authenticity of this data so and would the data itself be stored in the cloud or on the wallet or uh, it, initially, it will be stored on the user's device. So every user has his own data on his own phone. So this also helps us to prevent from that data leakages. Uh, you know, if a hacker uh, compromise one device, he will get access only to this user uh, data and not to the entire database, unlike, uh, you know, centralized databases. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. We're going to adopt all the state-of-the-art technologies in the mobile mobile security to protect the users. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Well, everything uh, everything usually comes with a trade-off, and so if you're storing data on one device, I guess the trade-off is you have the additional security. But what happens if the device gets broken or stolen? Is there a way to back it up? Yeah, so we are implementing some mechanisms to back up the uh, most important data on multiple devices. And we have these those mechanisms seen, seen already in other crypto projects for uh, you know private key recovery. You can ask your friends, multiple friends, to... Uh, vouch for you so that you can get back control of, of, of your private key. Um, we are working to make the UX uh, a little bit better than what it is only with the PKI schemes. <laughs> um, what, what platform are you building this on? I assume it's Ethereum, but... Uh... Yes, so the, the first prototype, uh, it's, it's going to be Ethereum. We are also doing our crowd sale based on a ERC-20 token. And at the moment, and given the, the scale of Ethereum, the features it provides, 
uh, it's the platform that makes the most sense. But we're all, always on the lookout for new technologies. I'm looking at Cardano, Neo, EOS, and I'm hopeful in the future we might get some uh, alternatives. Uh, at the moment, Ethereum seems the only way to go if you want to build a, a smart contract project. Hmm. And uh, it, would the idea of building your own blockchain be ever in the future, or is that just not where you want to go with it? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, this this is an option as well. Uh, but uh, we need further uh, research and development uh, before we get to that stage. I think I think this is uh, often uh, an indicator of where we're at as uh, as a blockchain community overall. Everyone who is starting a new blockchain project, even if they're doing it on Ethereum, it always has in the back of their mind, well, if if the need arises, we will build our own blockchain. Whereas nobody in an internet company says, well, if the need arises, we'll build our own internet. <laughs> so I think that just says that the, uh, the state and how early blockchain truly is. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right. I wanted to uh, actually ask you, a little bit about your ICO process. Uh, like, how long have you been working at it? Uh, first of all, when did you decide to do an ICO? We wanted to do an ICO. It was not the first uh, idea that we had in mind to do an ICO. We were in the process of raising money last summer, uh, but we were also having this vision of what we saw digital identity space and the personal data space going at. We first started, if we wanted to be competitive in five years, we needed to have far more than the product that we currently have. And um, therefore, it was born the vision that we have for today for this, uh, for this valid project. But we also realized as we were creating and, and putting together the concept, we also quickly realized all the money that we were going to be needing. Because uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's a rather ambitious project, and blockchain engineers aren't exactly cheap. Um, as we were approaching a bunch of uh, uh, venture capitalists uh, for our initial fundraising process, uh, everyone we were talking to was saying, you know, you basically have the perfect blockchain project for, for, for an ICO. You've got the credibility, you've got the existing product, you've got the vision for it. Uh, and, 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 it's, and it's because we were you know, very much encouraged to do so that we started looking at the possibility of doing an ICO. And, and so far, so good. We've done fairly well, very well, in fact. With, uh, with the pre-sale and we intend to continue doing so in the cross-sale comes. That's interesting. Uh, uh, like, so when did you start your pre-sale? It started on February 3rd and it was on for a day only. One day only. And um, uh, what I've been talking to with, uh, I've talked to a number of people who've been in the middle of their ICOs in the past while. Um, and I've just been curious because the crypto market really took a dive in the past couple of weeks. And it seems to have more or less leveled out now, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering, has that negatively affected your, uh, your expectations or your ICO and, uh, or has it changed the numbers at all? No, it has not. I'm sure it's, it affected it because in fact, on February 3rd, uh, I think the market was about to lose some 20 to 30%. So, uh, the, the, the first day of our pre-sale was one of the first days where the market started tanking, um, now, it's difficult to say whether the money that we raised that day could have been raised in an hour rather than in eight hours. It's difficult to say, I can't. I'm sure that it affected it. Uh, I'm sure people were waiting perhaps for it to rebound and, and thought, well, the hell with the pre-sale, I'll wait for the market to rebound and come in the main sale. But we don't really have a way to, to actually uh, make, make that judgment. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, that makes sense. Uh, some of the other people that I had talked to in various projects had said uh, what they did is they moved more of their token sale to the pre-sale or private. Uh, I talked to someone uh, recently who uh, who did their entire token sale private, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I'm I'm just wondering what was your decision behind the on the numbers, the decision of how much to do pre-sale, how much to do crowd sale. Well, pre-sale was important because not only did this project was was built uh, and supported by a number of, let's call it, the crypto elite of, of the surrounding areas here, the Crypto Valley, and uh, we needed an allocation for the people that had been 
backing us, supporting us, advising us. So having a pre-sale makes a lot of sense. Also, by having a pre-sale, you, you get to gauge a little bit and you get to adjust things, should not, should things not be as optimized as you, you wish they were. Um, so it's a good way to test the market and uh, we, we, we did very well. We, in fact, performed much better than we, we thought. It was a very smooth list process and we raised all the money that we had planned to raise. Um, with regards to your question as to whether we should do you know, the allocation for pre private sales should be a lot bigger than it is now. We, uh, the success of our project depends on community building. And therefore, uh, we are not fans of having big crypto wells coming in. In fact, we have very much restricted uh, the ability to invest. It's important for us to have uh, to build uh, a very large community of supporters and believers in, in Valid. And therefore, main sale is, is what matters. Uh, the, uh, I, that does make sense. I mean, if you're if you're dealing with the crowd for your main product, then money from the crowd helps grow that uh, gr crowd that'll use it. Um, now, you did this in uh, in Switzerland, in part of the Crypto Valley. Was uh, what was the decision behind going to Switzerland? Well, most of us are Swiss. Oh, okay. Um, we're, we're, we're <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the, the majority of the team in Georgia happens to be our Italian token. Um, yeah, but uh, I mean, the, I think hundred percent of the team we were all already living in Zurich or uh, Geneva in the case of Ibs. So we are hundred percent Swiss. And it's a no-brainer because Switzerland happens to have relatively friendly regulations and stands with regards to blockchain and ICOs, etc. They're very pragmatic in terms of how they want to regulate this going forward. So yeah. it's very much free. I've talked to a, a number of people that have said that uh, Switzerland's easily the most expensive place to launch the ICO. Uh, if you if you go there, and uh, I mean, I've seen people have sort of two minds about it. Uh, have you found it to be overly expensive, or is it just that you're still uh, so into normal prices? What I've, what I've realized is that you can't really do an ICO in Switzerland without having a reputable law firm attached to it, and if you don't have a law firm attached to it, you're likely to get a phone call from the local uh, the FINMA, which is the Swiss equivalent of the SEC, and by having a reputable law firm attached to it, obviously this you know, this, this means you'll incur more costs than if you did it. Uh, but generally speaking, ICOs have become more expensive. The, the space has become more and more crowded. So the marketing the marketing budget overall, not just for Switzerland, has increased tremendously. It's a lot harder to be visible today than it was six months ago. So if I was uh, if I was planning an ICO and considering Switzerland, how like what should I budget for the ICO process leading up to the pre-ICO? It's difficult to comment. We have we 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 know what some of our peers have budgeted for, and uh, it was a lot more than what we budgeted for. Uh, uh, fair you, enough. You, it's, it's 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 you know I, you have to a few hundred thousand is the minimum spent of the, with all the tech partners, and all the partners. Offerings and so on, and that's without a that's without a the uh, kind of marketing budget that we, we are beginning to see. Mm. But we spend very minimal money on marketing. How did you manage to uh, to get as far as you did with uh, keeping marketing to a minimum? Well, it's funny when you said that. We we're quite pleased with the way we are. We built we built the community in rather organic fashion. We we had a company before. We had a community. We have some products, so we were able to leverage a lot on that. Um, it's not, you know, a lot of criticism that we get often is, you know, how come you don't have much hype? You know, your product sounds great, but you know, there's only 3,000 people on Telegram. And apparently now uh, a lot of these ICOs have 80,000 people. But you also get to see why they get these numbers. And the way they get these numbers in us is not necessarily through very organic marketing. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily a big fan. We're not necessarily big fans of of, of gaining tractions and, and, and users and, and visitors through through uh, ways that are anything less than organic. If you will. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, okay, question: uh, What's the what does the next uh, couple of months bring? What's uh, the roadmap? What should we expect from Valid? Yeah, so now the crowd sale is approaching. It will start the 24th of February. It's on a Saturday, so it means a lot of weekend work for us. And this is going to be the main focus. At the same time, me and the tech team are working on uh, putting, down the, putting down the foundations for Valid. 
uh, meaning this identity uh, um, project. We are gonna we are working on a Ethereum standard called the ERC seven two five and seven three five. Is the equivalent of the ERC twenty but mapping the identity. So this is uh, very, very exciting. We want to be one of the first company to go out with an implementation of it and be the thought leader. And uh, I guess after the crowd sale is over, we will present uh, a very comprehensive uh, technical roadmap for the milestones and what we want to achieve for, for one. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about this standard, because that's actually quite interesting that there's now a standard being developed for identity on Ethereum. Uh, what sort of things are being incorporated into this standard? So if you look at all the identity projects like Sovereign, Newport, Civic, uh, and how our EID Plus we have for the Canton of Schaffhausen work, they all have the same blueprint. There is an identity and then there is a, an authority issuing claims about this identity. And um, they, they all have the same blueprint template, but they do not work together. They cannot work together. And what the Ethereum community came up with is, oh, why don't we standardize the interfaces so that if there are multiple identity projects using this standard, they can work together. So if you look at the ERC20 token, what happened is that by having a standard, uh, you know, exchanges could accept all the ERC20 uh, tokens they wanted by simply adding them because they, the interface and the protocol was standard. The same now could be true for identity. Let's say your exchange decide to accept uh, ERC seven to five identities. What they can do, they can enable it once, and then they accept all the projects using this standard interface. So we are really excited about that because uh, this could be a game changer in the in the identity space for Ethereum and for also other projects. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would imagine so. Um, standards are always such a difficult space because you got to get the buy-in from all sorts of people who are potentially working on projects that are competing. Um, and getting into a consortium to solve sort of a common problem and generate this standard that everyone agrees on, uh, it's valuable for the industry, And uh, but everyone sort of wants to claw at it. Have you found that the 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 other participants have uh, was it easy to convince them to be on board with the standard or was uh, did it take a lot of um talking so my my feeling is that the established projects they are a bit um scared of this protocol because they say yeah because we have already done all the all our homeworks and uh, our software already works why would we change our entire architecture to adopt this protocol all the newcomers are were really welcoming this protocol because uh, like in the case of the erc20 it really enabled this ico uh, some that many icos because it was so easy to adopt and so interoperable and that it was a no-brainer for ICOs to adopt this standard. And hopefully it will become the same for identity projects. Well, it sounds like it's a really exciting time for you guys. Best of luck with your ICO. When, what's the date when it uh, starts? It's the 24th of February at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Berlin time and Zurich time. And uh, they, people can visit valid.global, I guess, to uh, sign up for uh, the whitelist? Exactly. All right. Exactly. No, there's no whitelist. It's uh, open oh, for everyone. Okay, perfect. So valid.global to find out more. Thank you very much, Eve. Thank you very much, Giorgio, for joining me today. And best of luck with your sale. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Nathan. Thank you.